I'll be reading from the New International Version. The scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we come in all humility, asking that the meditations of all our hearts, the words we speak and the actions we take might be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a junior in college, Sister Helen Prejean came to give a talk about her book, Dead Man Walking, the story that she felt compelled to tell after serving as a spiritual advisor to Patrick Sagne, a death row inmate in Louisiana. Now I remember just bits and pieces of what Sister Helen specifically said that night, but one thing I remember was how she told the story of meeting Patrick for the first time. Her order of nuns had been taking on this pen pal project in the community, and she began exchanging letters with people sentenced to death and awaiting execution at the Louisiana State Penitentiary. Sister Helen assigned, was assigned to Patrick, so they wrote letters back and forth, and then she decided to visit him in prison. I remember her telling this part of the story, how she prepared to make the visit, how she was nervous. She told about sitting and waiting for him to come and listening to the chains clanking as Patrick came down the hallway to the visiting spot. And then how when she finally saw him, he wasn't anything like she was expecting to see. She had drawn up in her mind, as well-intentioned and good-hearted a woman as she was, she had drawn up in her mind what a death row inmate would look like or sound like. And this person standing in front of her didn't match that picture. She said, I'd never seen a murderer before. 
I thought I'd be able to tell it on his face or something, but I looked through that grate and I went, oh my God, he's human. The feeling was mutual, apparently, Sister Helen told us that night. Patrick said that she wasn't like any nun he'd ever heard of. The way she dressed, the way she spoke, her sense of humor and personality defied his expectations of what a nun would look like. We all move through the world with ideas about who people are, preconceived notions or stereotypes, an image or a feeling or a thought that pops into our mind when we hear the word nun or death row inmate or just like ballet dancer or doctor or president. Our minds, shaped by the systems and society in which we've been stewing our whole lives, our minds assign expected physical characteristics, gender, or race, or age, appearance, or dress, or mannerisms to these words. How many times have strangers walked into this church during the week, looked at me, and said, wait, You're the pastor? Lots of times. How many times have some of you in here had a moment where you weren't who someone was expecting to see? Where somebody's bias came into play, whether they said it out loud or not. But they weren't expecting the coach to be in a wheelchair. Or they thought the doctor would be a man. Or they expected the whoever to be white. And there you are. And there are times when we're on the other side, when we're the ones whose brains have already jumped to a conclusion about who someone is or what we're expecting, and our own biases are contradicted by the person standing before us. In today's reading from the Gospel of John, we hear about fans of Jesus who have never met him and are in for a surprise when they find out what he's really like. Here in John chapter 12, we learn that some Greek people are in town in Jerusalem for the Jewish festival, and they are really interested in meeting Jesus. They have apparently heard about him, and they are asking around, trying to get an in. They find the disciple Philip. They tell him, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip tells Andrew, and Andrew tells Jesus, and this great game of telephone has a very unsatisfying conclusion. Because this Jesus isn't who the Greeks were looking for. This isn't the Christ they were expecting to find. Jesus hears that these people are looking to meet him, and then he just starts talking about how it's time for him to be glorified, by which he means, he clarifies, it's time to die. This is not the PR tactic his disciples have encouraged. Here are these Greek tourists, travelers, who are ostensibly well-studied. They come from this philosophical tradition in ancient Greece, right? They want to see Jesus this teacher and healer that everyone's been talking about, the supposed Messiah, the Christ. When they say, we wish to see Jesus, who do you think they're picturing? Maybe an eloquent intellectual, an orator, the kind of philosopher who would be elevated in Greek society. But here is Jesus. In his prime time moment, the hour for glory, and he says, well, it's time for me to die. It's time for me to be buried like this lowly grain of wheat. And anyone who wants to follow me has to follow me there. Guess who Jesus is? The Jewish residents of Jerusalem were expecting a military hero. The Greek visitors were maybe expecting a brainy, charismatic philosopher, and here instead is a dead man walking. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He continues, those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. It gets harder and harder to be a follower of Jesus the closer we get to Holy Week, the closer we get to the cross. We like a lot of the parables of Jesus, the healing stories that have become Sunday school classics, the speeches about the person without sin throw the first stone. But when Jesus starts talking about sacrifice, when Jesus starts talking about death, letting go of lives that we love, we tend to step back a little, keep that stuff at arm's length. It's easy. You know, it's especially easy as a preacher to kind of make Jesus into a puppet who says what I agree with, who endorses my political candidates, my social views and personal choices. But Jesus, as we believe him to be, as he's depicted in the Gospels, was an inherently challenging guy. He made pretty much everyone uncomfortable at one point or another. So if I'm not made uncomfortable by anything I hear in church or interpret from scripture or hear from God in other ways, it is likely that I'm not engaging with the fullness of Christ. It's easy to make Jesus into who I want him to be, who I'm expecting or picturing him to be and simply miss or conveniently ignore his teachings and example that are outside the box of my comfort. The game of Guess Who was invented in the late 70s, became popular in the 1980s. It's played between two players. You have a grid of characters, and from that grid, your opponent tries to guess who your secret character is by asking yes or no questions. Does your person have a hat? If no, eliminate all the people with hats. Does your person wear glasses? Cross off all those people wearing glasses and so on until you narrow it down. I originally chose this game for this scripture because toward the end of the passage that Steve read for us, you remember there's a voice from heaven that kind of affirms Jesus and people are trying to guess who the voice is. Is it thunder? Is it an angel? And it's God. So that's as far as I got with the guess who parallel. Guess who? It's God. But when I revisited it this week, I was looking at the scripture. I was thinking about these Greek people looking for Jesus, how they're trying to pick him out in a crowd in Jerusalem. And if they've got an image in their mind, right, a bias, an expectation of what the Christ will look like or sound like or do, there are a lot of people they won't consider. They'll just automatically mark them off. That guy's uneducated, can't be the Christ. That guy's unkempt. That one speaks the wrong dialect. That one over there is a woman, non-starter. They thought they could pick Jesus out based on who they expected him to be, but it turned out it's not that easy. I thought about that and then I thought about us. Just like those Greek folks in ancient Jerusalem, we have preconceived notions of where we might find a word from God. Or we have grouped off people like you do in the game of Guess Who. We have grouped off the kinds of people we want to listen to, to learn more about faith. We have expectations of what Jesus is all about. And it is not uncommon for me to completely tune out the teachings I don't want to hear. Or we tune out the people we don't want to hear them from. God speaks loudly and clearly in this passage from John 12. God has spoken in this way before in the Gospels. It should not be inconceivable to people that this voice from the sky talking about Jesus is God, but they're like, what? Who's that? It's thunder. Maybe because what God says is confusing. Or maybe they don't agree, but it's God. The point is God's voice isn't always readily recognizable to us as individuals or us as a community because of our biases, because of our expectations. 
Jesus isn't always who we picture him to be, doesn't always or usually say what we want to hear. And so how do we hear the voice of God? How do we seek active relationship with Christ in ways that are genuine, that stretch us? How do we make sure we're not writing off whole groups of people as potential God bearers? Or that we're not discounting hard teachings just because they make us uncomfortable? Well, we practice humility I think we practice admitting that we were wrong, that we could be wrong again, that we have much to learn. We examine our own biases. It's not a shameful thing to have them, but they are worth looking at honestly. We work on our listening, right? That's the theme of this whole year, listening, meaning not talking or thinking of what we're going to say when the other person is done talking but stilling our minds to be receptive to the fact that the Holy Spirit may be trying to tell us something in the silence or in the words of another person. Jesus isn't always who we expect. Sister Helen Prejean regularly visited and gave spiritual counsel to Patrick Saunier until and all the way through his execution. I remember this part of her talk too, after all these years. She told us how after two and a half years of their letters and visits, Patrick learned of his execution date via electric chair. And he told her she didn't have to be there, didn't have to be present because he was afraid it would be scarring to her. But Sister Helen said, I will. I will be there. You're not going to die alone. And Patrick said he was terrified. And she said, look at my face the whole time. Look at my face when they do this to you, and I will be the face of Christ for you. She wanted him to know his dignity. I remember her saying, I wanted him to see a loving face when he died. And she showed up, and she witnessed. And just as she was the face of Christ for Patrick, the face of assurance, of grace, Patrick was the face of Christ for her. Christ in the executed. Christ in the convicted and condemned human. Are we willing to see that? Are we willing to meet Christ in all the people he said we'd find him? Sister Helen went on from that experience to write a book and then another and another. She went on to continue serving as spiritual advisor to both death row inmates and to the families of their victims. She traveled the world advocating for an end to the death penalty for more than 40 years and counting. Her life as she knew it, as she thought she loved it, she let it go after that first night in the execution chamber with Patrick Saunier. She buried her old life in the ground, a single seed, and God has taken it from there, made her into an unforgettable witness for mercy, an agent of change. Are we willing to let the voice of God call us to places we'd rather not go? Ask us to engage with people we'd rather not love? Wrestle with our biases and prejudices and the systems that reinforce them? Are we willing to lose what we think is so important in our lives, to lose the lives we think we love, with the promise that abundance is on the other side of that choice, that our lives, once we let go of them, can be instruments of healing and justice and peace. May we go from this place, open to Christ in the stranger, 
receptive to God's voice from unexpected sources, truly listening. For God is indeed still speaking. Amen. Thank you for being with us in worship today and for all who helped to lead in our time of worship. And a reminder to join us in the fellowship hall for conversation and for coffee and for treats. It's just down the hall, follow the people and you will find us there. And as we go out, I pray that you go, will go with courage and with openness, knowing that God is speaking and calling all around us that we have everything we need to respond in community. Go with love and with hope in the name of Christ. Amen. NBUMC Weekly is a production of North Bethesda United Methodist Church located in Bethesda, Maryland. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook at North Bethesda UMC or on Instagram at Loving All Neighbors. All music is licensed via Christian Copyright Licensing International, CCLI. <laughs>